both to one. Here we go. Here we are now, live. Hello and good evening. Um, welcome to the Coracle Live uh, this uh, Friday, November 5th. And um, my name is Sydney Bell, and I'm really delighted to be here with uh, Danielle Blackwood uh, for one of our Coracle Live uh, Books, Bards, and Ballads conversations. And uh, Danielle is joining me from uh, British Columbia. And we are going to have just some interesting chit chat together about her work and um, and her books. Uh, Danielle is a author, uh, archetypal astrologer, and registered counseling therapist. And uh, Danielle, I'm just so thrilled that you're joining me in conversation this evening. Hello and welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Sydney. I'm excited so, to be here. So glad. So glad. Um, so, Danielle, we're going to, go, you know, go into all the things and talk about all your books and things, but would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, like you mentioned, I am I'm an archetypal astrologer. I have been studying and practicing astrologer, astrology for a little more than 30 years. I am also a registered counselor in private practice. My therapeutic approach is transpersonal, archetypal, person-centered, and it is rooted in feminist theory. So awesome. what else can I, pardon? <laughs> I'll <hear> that. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good thing, I think. It is yeah. always a good thing. Um, I recently obtained a certificate in Jungian and post-Jungian clinical concepts. And I've been a priestess and educator since 1994. So facilitating workshops, classes, retreats, um, public ritual, that kind of thing. I am the author of the 12 Faces of the Goddess, Transform Your Life with Astrology, Magic, and the Sacred Feminine, which came out in 2018. And the forthcoming A Lantern in the Dark, Navigating Life's Crossroads with Story, Ritual, and Sacred Astrology. So what more can I say? I'm, I'm a passionate, lifelong student of folklore, mythology, and depth psychology. Mm. And I live, my, my, that's what all my work centers on, really. Mm -hmm. And I, I live on the west coast of Canada on a little island called Salt Spring Island, um, which is the original lands and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. Mm -hmm. So that's me in a nutshell. Oh. It's a wonderful nutshell, Danielle. Uh, as you know, um, uh, a fellow Canadian who uh, who has been to your beautiful island of Salt Spring and just knows what a magical what what a magical place it is there. And I think your energy just sits so beautifully with it. Um, I want to say hello to the people who are joining in. Uh, nice to see you there. We've had a few people say hello in the chat. Really wonderful that you were able to join us for our conversation this evening. I'm sure you're going to um, enjoy our time with Danielle. Um, so Danielle, wondering, um, how long have you been writing and when when did you start? Um, that's a really great question. So um, I feel like I've really been a writer my whole life. I've always sort of identified as a writer, but my first published piece came out in way back in 2010 and it was in circle magazine which i don't think is even um, running anymore right circle magazine um yeah so from there i landed a column with stage woman magazine which was a huge oh. deal for me yeah, yeah. it was really it was really fun to write i did that for seven years and at the same time i was also writing a monthly column for banyan books in vancouver mm -hmm. an astrology column Right. So that's kind of the how my professional writing began. And then my first book, The Twelve Faces of the Goddess, um, it's, it was germinating really within me since I was 17, but I wasn't really ready to write it until I had more life experience under my belt. So when it was finally published by Llewellyn in 2018, it was like a culmination of of everything I'd learned over the years in my astrology practice, as well as some hard-won life experience that I'd gathered along the way. Mm. So 
it was it was really a, a lifelong dream come true when mm. I published that first book. It was like um, it was truly like winning the lottery. My fondest wish. <laughs> oh, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. I'm just so so thrilled. Yes, you've been um, yes doing this for a very very long time in different ways and places. Yeah, mm -hmm. in different ways and places, definitely. Wow, um, I've also been to Banyan Books. Um, <laughs> Magical <laughs> place. <laughs> a bit of a mecca in Vancouver, isn't it? It is, it's actually the oldest and largest metaphysical bookstore in the world. Mm. It, um, the Bodhi Tree in Los Angeles was bigger, but they, I believe, have since closed. And yeah, Banyan's been around since 1969. It was just a tiny little corner in the back of a vegetarian restaurant when it right. started. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, so you've been writing for a long time, Danielle. What I have. What has inspired you or, or motivated you to um, to to write, maybe generally, and also um, you know write um, your books, both uh, Twelve Faces of the Goddess and your new book. Yeah, um, I think it probably all really began because I wanted to help other people reframe their stories through an archetypal perspective. Mm. That's always been sort of a driving force in my own life, wanting to look at my own story through that archetypal lens. Um, and then I started to think, I'd also like to help other people be able to find out how to do that. Mm. So I think because of my own background, um, growing up with an, an abusive father with concurrent disorders, running away at the age of almost 17, um, mm -hmm. trying to make my way through a very real underworld, becoming a single parent, um, and finally putting myself through school at the age of 36 mm -hmm. with no financial help. <laughs> um, my mission became essentially to help other people reclaim their sovereignty and hopefully to help them re-enchant their lives by by seeing themselves as the protagonist of their own sacred stories. Oh my, that is a very powerful motivation, helping people re-enchant their life by seeing themselves as their own protagonist. Is that, is yeah, that, oh. yeah. Just think, thinking about um, all story, um, mm -hmm. mythology, folklore, most of it does center around a character having to go through the dark wood or through a certain something, yes. you know, the road of trials, as Joseph Campbell calls it, yes. before they can actually become the hero or the heroine of their own story. So, yeah, consciously reframing all of those things instead of saying, oh, I went through this thing and I'm a, a victim of circumstance and saying, actually, no, that's what brought me to where I am now. That's what helped me accrue the wisdom and the strength that I have because specifically of those those hardships that someone has gone through. I really, I really like that conscious, that idea of conscious reframing. Um, and uh, definitely from what I've experienced of, of, of your work, um, I would say, yeah, you are, are well on the, not on the way you are doing uh, what you want to do in, in providing that uh, inspiration for people. Um, and I want to uh, just again extend a hello to those people who are joining us. And there's some wonderful comments coming in on, on the chat. And um, hello. So it's really great <laughs> to have you here. If you have a question for Danielle, uh, you know, pop it in there and I'll hopefully, you know, be able to catch it. Um, uh, but we will continue on our, our conversation here. And um, uh, so thinking more about your books, and you maybe have answered this a little bit already, um, but what will people learn from your books? Um, well, um, in the 12 Faces of the Goddess, I, I hope that readers will learn the basics of astrology as well as how to how to look at astrology through the perspective of the divine or the sacred feminine. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've always thought has been missing, not only in astrology, but across most disciplines. Um, in astrology, of all the 10 planets, the only ones that are considered uh, resonating from a, through a feminine lens are yes. the moon and Venus, and all right. of the rest of them are masculine. So um, I think that I personally have not seen any books 
from in astrology coming from that perspective when I wrote this book. So that was something that I, I really wanted to embody and embrace and put out into the world. I think that readers will also discover the guiding goddesses that are specific to their own birth chart. That's one of the most important things I think about that book, um, learning about themselves through cross-cultural myths and learning how astrology is intimately connected with magic, ritual, and the wheel of the year. Mm -hmm. So that is the 12 faces of the goddess and mm -hmm. what I hope that people will, will learn if they do read that book. Um, in my next book, which is coming out March 8th, I'm so excited about this one, it's called A Lantern in the Dark. Um, readers should learn about the specific crossroad times mm -hmm. that come up for everyone at around the same age. So for example, the Saturn return, which a lot of people have heard of, which occurs approximately between the ages of 27 and 30. Mm -hmm. And then there's the midlife transits, which happen again, approximately between the ages of 38 and 45. Mm -hmm. And finally, the second Saturn return, which happens between 58 and 60. So these typically are times that are, they're, they're like a psycho-spiritual crisis for a lot of people where you're really called to, to look at your life deeply, to reflect and ask yourself, where, where am I going? What did I come to do? Mm -hmm. So a lot of existential questions do come up during those crossroad times. So that book is essentially a self-care guidebook that I think that I think readers can discover alternative ways of gaining insight during those difficult passages of life through story, through ritual, through what I call sacred astrology. Mm. Sacred mm. astrology, I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to your new book. And if I can offer in terms of um, a learning from your first book was um, you've got some really, uh, 12 Faces of the Goddess, some really lovely uh, rituals in there as well, uh, as ways Thank to connect you. with the with the with the goddess goddesses. Um, so I, I would offer, you. offer that as a suggestion of uh, things people will learn reading your work. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, who do you think uh, will resonate with with your books? Um, seekers people who are looking for clarity, for comfort, for deeper layers of meaning in their life and mm -hmm. the events that unfold in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, I would say people who want to use sacred astrology, ritual and story in a practical way to enhance their everyday lives. They may not want to become an astrologer or an right. adept in any way, but they want to, to take these tools and use them to to make their everyday lives better. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote my next book, A Lantern in the Dark, like I mentioned, for people who find themselves at a crossroads at a, a dark night of the soul. And I think that many people know intuitively that they need something more during those times. Mm -hmm. They might feel that there are layers of meaning beneath the surface events that are happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. They might intuit correctly that these are junctures along the past that are somehow part of their unfolding myth, but they they can't quite put their finger on it or, or, you know, what's happening right now, but they right. know, they feel intuitively, this is something big that I'm, I'm crossing a threshold now mm -hmm. and I'm not sure exactly why or what the underlying purpose is. So I think that this particular book, A Lantern in the Dark is, it's about, um, helping people find the underlying archetypal meaning of those times, finding um, practical ways to navigate through those times. And I think understanding where we're at can be like a, a light in the dark. And um, I find that sacred astrology and all of these tools can be a useful complement to both therapy and self-help. They can help us illuminate our paths forward and bring the underlying meaning of, of a given rite of passage to light. And I feel like that's one of the most important things that I'm trying to bring forward right now. So mm. what, bringing in the underlying meaning of a given rite of passage to light. So you said that's yes. really powerful mm -hmm. stuff. 
really. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think everyone's, everyone has these transits, these big crossroad times in their own way, you know, that you have to look at the person's, your, your own life specifics and where you're at. But there are certain archetypal themes that will arise with for everyone, but they might play out in a slightly different way. So that's another thing to re remember. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Maria has uh, posted in the, in the comments, and I'm just chuckling a little bit because she's saying that she's curious about her own, uh, her, her own um, uh, astrological connections. And she's constantly mm -hmm. identified with the masculine planet being in Aries. Uh, so uh, just chuckling a little Maria because both uh, Danielle and myself are also Aries women. So you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're in, good, in good company. So I'm sure you'll find a lot of interesting insight <laughs> in the uh, 12 faces of the goddess. Um, yeah, that's uh, the Aries chapter. I had a lot of fun writing. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so thank you for talking, you know, about about your books. And we will circle back and you're going to, um, uh, you know, maybe read an excerpt or maybe one of your meditations from your book in a little bit. But yeah, can we switch gears for a little while and talk about your the writing process? Sure, and, absolutely. Um, I was curious about, you know, as you're doing this work, if, um, uh, you know, what surprised you about the writing process? <laughs> um, I think that the thing that surprised me most is when you have hard deadlines, that oh. writing is work. <laughs> ah. um, so, so I think that, yeah, so once you sign the contract, it, it, it becomes not only an exercise in self-exploration, Mm. It's it's more than that. And um, I think that's one of the things that was, wow, okay. Um, so I had to find that sweet spot between inspiration and creativity on one hand, right. and on the other, finding that discipline to sit down every day at my computer and right. literally work for eight or more hours a day writing, mm -hmm. which before I had never really done. I mean, I wrote papers for school and such, but this was a whole other thing. And um, it was, it was kind of a learning curve. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's bringing a whole other mindset to it. Absolutely. So that's one thing I think um, that, well, I anyway grappled with a little bit and in, in terms of, of learning about the writing process in a, in a professional way, actually trying to write a book from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, we been asked a little question, or you have, uh, Danielle, uh, from mm -hmm. Judy, who says she's ordering 12 faces of the goddess. Do you talk about Scorpio rising? Um, I actually have Scorpio rising as well. Ah. Um, but I don't talk about the rising signs. So what the whole uh, idea is with the book is that we all have all 12 signs in our chart. So if you know you have Scorpio rising, I would suggest that you read the Scorpio chapter, absolutely. Go through the Scorpio rituals, the mm -hmm. guided meditation, contemplate the correspondences for Scorpio. Um, also read your sun sign, your moon sign, the, all of the signs actually, because like I said, mm -hmm. you have every single one of those signs and those goddess archetypes somewhere in your psyche. Mm -hmm. Somewhere that, you know, you're gonna have some that are stronger than others. So for instance, your sun, moon, rising sign, if you really know your chart well, and you know you've got, say, a stellium in your fourth house, then read the Cancer chapter <laughs> or you, or anything like that. But please do, I think the best thing to do is to get a copy of your chart, which you can find um, online pretty much anywhere now for free, mm -hmm. and write down what, sign, what planets you have in what signs, and then read them. And then look at the houses or life areas that those signs and planets show up in and you kind of layer it as you're going along. You know, so so maybe you have um, Mars and Aries in the first house. So you're going to read about Aries, but then you're going, it's not the first house, let's pick another house, the 10th house. So you'll read about Mars and Aries, and then you would also read about the 10th house because it's always like this: a planet shines through a, the lens of a sign but it's it takes 
it's like the action of that planet tends to take place in the life area uh, that it's in. You see what I mean? Does that make any sense at all? I wish I had a chart I could put up here no. so I could yeah, no, point to it. Yeah, yeah. I and and I really appreciate the the whole um, the recognition again that we all have aspect or aspects of the mall with within us. They maybe yes. um, uh, represent themselves differently because they show up in different areas of our chart, but. Um, yeah. th that's there's something really empowering about knowing that that we have connections to yeah. all aspects of ourselves, and all yeah. these um, uh, the opportunity to connect with all these beautiful goddesses um, as well. Mm -hmm. I think that if nothing else, read your Sun, Moon, and Rising sign okay. because those are sort of um, they're what Stephen Forrest calls. Stephen Forrest is a very wonderful astrologer who's mm -hmm. kind of one of my mentors um but he talks about the primal triad which is the sun oh. moon and rising so the sun is like your core self your identity the moon is your your feeling self your emotions your soul and then your persona is your rising sign it's the way you meet the world the way that you take the world in so those three things even if you only read those signs mm -hmm. and kind of get a feel for how those archetypes are playing out in your world, in your life, through your life stories, mm -hmm. that will give you a lot to go on to begin with. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so thinking again about your writing process, um, Danielle, what would you say is the most important um, lesson perhaps that you've learned through this, uh, through these uh, creative mm. works that you've engaged in? Right. Um, well, I think that the most important lesson I personally learned was, or is that when you know the rules, you can break them. Mm. <laughs> so I think that before I took first year English in university, um, and I'm not saying everybody has to go to university, but take a writing course if you can, mm -hmm. um, just to, if you don't have those basics under your belt. Um, because I thought I could write before I took that that first year English um, class. I had the drive, I had the inspiration. I was I felt like I was creative, but I really did not know the basic rules of writing. Mm. Um, so I honestly think that good writing is a blend of structure. So having a sound container along with imagination and inspiration. Mm -hmm. Writing only from an academic perspective, I think can sometimes feel dry, it can feel uninspired, but writing only from the imagination also has its pitfalls because it needs that structure to be able to take that message and get it across in, in, articul in an articulate way. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, one of the most important things that I did learn. Mm -hmm. And I was quite thankful that I had done that, so know the yeah. rules so you can break them right yes <laughs> in a nutshell again yes i would say so <laughs> yeah yes and then yes you can break them i think that you once yeah. you know the rules you can start mm -hmm. bending and shaping mm -hmm. and playing with them and and being very creative within those parameters but it, it i think writing needs that saturn structure right yeah right Mm -hmm. So, Danielle, you talked a little bit earlier about how, you know, uh, suddenly you have a deadline and it becomes work. And I'm sure there are other things that come up in life that make, uh, you know, the writing process tough. Uh, so I'm wondering yeah. what uh, yeah. what keeps you motivated when, when things get tough? Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, I like to refill my well by spending time in nature. So mm -hmm. in the forest mm -hmm. or by the water where I live, I like to go out and just walk. Um, I think also taking time to stretch, maybe to dance in my living room. That's one of the things I do too, just to kind of get out of my head and into my body. I find that to be very helpful when I'm feeling um, stuck. Um, yeah, even doing something mundane, if you're, you know, for me anyway, with having a writer's block, if I go and vacuum the living room floor, or do some la laundry, I find that helps as well. And one of the things that helps me the very most of all is taking a bath. And um, honestly, if I'm ever stuck with, with that serious writer's block, I will close my computer, go upstairs and run the tub. And it's funny because I actually have some of my best inspiration 
in the bath. And I, I don't know if that's because I have um, Mercury and Pisces or anything like that. Um, a lot of water yeah. signs going on. Yeah, well, you have Mercury and Pisces, which is Mercury is the, you know, communication, your way of gathering and disseminating right. information. And it happens to be in the sign of Pisces. So it actually works for me. Um, so I can, I sometimes take even like up to three baths a day when I'm in book jail. And I I just go up. I wish I need to get a hot tub one of these days is what I need to I save so. up for. But um, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, whatever works, I think. But those are the things that have worked for me. Yeah. And I'm, uh, as I was saying, I was uh, dipping back into the 12 faces of the goddess before our chat. And there's quite a few, um, uh, you know, bath uh, salts, um, little work path workings in there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, lovely. Um, right. uh, uh, folks are sharing their, um, the th what did you call them? The three, the tribal three? Um, oh, the primal triad. Primal triad. Yeah. Yes. You can call it the tribal three. That's good too. Primal triad. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, I just saw this. My Mercury is in Pisces too, Bath Queen over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Jenna too. You too? Have Mercury, Mercury and Pisces, Pisces and finding inspiration in the Bath. That is. Oh, sorry. Well, there's. Oh, I see. <laughs> Your first comment. Got it. <laughs> totally. Yes. So thinking about your two, you've got two books under your belt now. Well, one is just almost there, uh, just coming out soon. Um, yeah. So thinking, comparing those experiences, um, what was the um, what was the same in 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 those experiences, and what was what was different? Um, well, I structured my day much the same with both books, um, kind of treating it like a regular work day. Mm -hmm. I would get up in the morning, make my tea, sit down at my desk and, and work until noon and have a little, you know, just that kind of thing. I found that really having that structure really helped me. Um, with the first book, I think I had a lot more anxiety. I, it was almost like starting a new job. I, everything was new to me in terms of, um, I didn't know how long it would take me exactly to finish a chapter or how much I could really get done in one day. I was very strict with myself during my first book. I probably didn't see any friends for about four and a half months. It was really tough. Um, probably, I don't think I went anywhere at all during the time. I was just really head down. Um, I think that with the second book, I I had a much more clear idea of what I was capable of. So I believe I wrote it in a, a shorter time frame. looking back, like quite a bit shorter time frame. Um, I also gave myself a little bit of permission to do, do a few things like seeing a friend occasionally for coffee, you know, going away on a weekend and writing from a different space that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the difference, I think, just kind of being more familiar with the territory. Right. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's, um, you know, having completed the first one, having that faith in yourself that you know that you can do it, you've done it. Mm -hmm. So you can yes. perhaps bring up a little bit of that earned wisdom. Um, Absolutely, yes. Like saying, I've done this before, I can do it again. And right. even when those moments come, and they do come where you're up at four o'clock in the morning going, please, you know, where is this next paragraph coming from? Yeah, but, for sure. um, just, sure. just trusting, I think, that it will come and it does come. Yeah. So, do you have any words of wisdom? Um, for those of us who maybe have aspirations uh, to, put, to put pen to paper and, and produce a publication? Oh, yeah, I think I have a, a few words, things that worked for me anyway, mm -hmm. that maybe can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things I would say is create an outline. Mm -hmm. It can be flexible, but do create an outline. If you can create an outline for each chapter, that would be great too. But begin with an outline first. I think that these things can be really useful, especially when things do get tough. Um, like I said, you can be flexible with that outline, you can swap things in and out, you can change it, but having some kind of a, 
a skeleton or a structure can be super helpful. Um, it's invaluable, really. I also think if you can try and get as many of your research books together as before you begin work. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the biggest things of all, keep track of all your references as you mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. I learned that in my with my first book. Yeah. It was like a nightmare <laughs> in the last month or so trying to figure out where I found everything. I'd taken some books back to the library and written things right. on scraps of paper. Right. And it was just like, oh my goodness. So yeah, keep very organized with your references, write them down so that when the time comes, they're just like bang, bang, bang into the bibliography. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I would say. Um, give yourself a deadline. I think that is really, really helpful. Even if it's just to do one chapter, just say, I'm going to do one chapter in a month. Mm -hmm. And by this date, it will be done. It doesn't have to be perfect, but give yourself a deadline. Um, I procrastinated for years with my first book, like writing little bits here and there, and but it never really kind of gave myself that, okay, it has to be done by now. But mm -hmm. <laughs> so it wasn't until I facilitated a retreat in 2016 and I led a group of participants through a, a new moon ritual and um, we were setting intentions and my intention was, I'm gonna, compile all those scraps and I'm going to send three sample chapters to the publisher in one month. Mm -hmm. So I did that and um, that's what I did. So on the on the following new moon after that one, I hit send mm -hmm. and that was, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't just sort of make it, this is what's happening. This is my intention, Yeah, do it. Yeah, so that's another thing. Um, I would also add, look to your life experiences, your passions, um write something that only you can write i think that there are tons of books on any given subject but none that bring your particular personality your experience your wisdom your history all together in one place so i think get started and believe you can do it because you can it is doable just set yourself that little deadline and and start where you're at it seems so daunting before a first book is published, I think, but it you can do it. Yeah. That's um, fantastic advice. Thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you. I'm really enjoying our, our conversation and uh, I'm seeing a lot of um, uh, comments and, and people are, are chiming in about their own writing process and uh, it's, it's really awesome. Um, I see Maria here has a question. She says, what are some of the most helpful tips or allies you have found in reconciling, owning, and rewriting your own journey through the underworld? All I need to hear that question again. Sorry, could you start from the top with that one? I sure can. What are some of the most helpful tips or allies you have found in reconciling, owning and rewriting your own journey through the underworld um she goes on to say all the painful experiences your own shadow and eventually finding sovereignty and inner love which you radiate uh oh, yeah, thank you that. so that's such um, a big question that's a great question but i almost feel like i need some time to mm -hmm. pause before answering it um mm -hmm. tips to to write about your own journey through the underworld is that kind of it in it well i think reconciling owning and rewriting your journey through the underworld yeah um and, you, and you're right that is that is a a really big and insightful question there's um, a lots of moving parts it's a great question mm -hmm. um i would think first step would be reflecting and giving yourself permission to just to, to journal about it and mm -hmm. write down some of the key points, maybe do a timeline mm -hmm. of your, your life. Um, you know, doing a timeline, writing the, the, the key things that have happened during a given time. And then really just sitting with it and seeing what comes up and trying to find too. Another thing that I find really can help is finding a story that you can sort of put down beside your story, a story that, that, resonates with your own story and there's so many stories out there but 
I mean, you can start in many different places. You can look at some of the archetypes of the goddess that I have in my first book. Right. You can go in many different directions with that. But finding a story that has echoes or resonates with what you yourself have gone through. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, is, that can be one of the most powerful things that, that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite stories in terms of underworld journeying is of course the story of the goddess Inanna who goes down into right. the underworld. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, if you can, I write about that in my second book, but please do look online, look for a Jungian interpretation of that story. Um, there's lots out there, but the whole story is of, she is the, the queen of heaven and earth. She is the goddess of the top side world. And she hears something, just a, a call from outside her awareness calling her to I won't go into all the details, but down into the underworld to mm -hmm. visit her sister, Ereshkigal, who is her shadow self, essentially. So she has to go through seven gates mm -hmm. before she gets to the underworld. And um, at each, each gate, she needs to surrender something that is emblematic of her topside world existence, her status as a goddess in that conscious mm -hmm. world. So by the time she gets to the underworld she's as they say in the in the the old cuneiform um she is naked and bowed low so i think that that's really important because a lot of times for all of us when we are going through an underworld journey and i think most of us have been through something like that at some point in different ways the ways to the underworld are many um we feel naked and bowed low we feel like the things that are are talismans that sort of this is who i am this is my education this is my beauty my youth my everything um those things don't help us anymore when we're down there mm -hmm. anyway so i don't know if i should tell this whole story of this um this this goddess but i would say it's one to really look at because she she does come up again she is reborn she goes through a harrowing mm -hmm. experience she's actually killed in the underworld hung on a hook to rot, which is just, you know, gross, but that's the ancients mm -hmm. for you. And, um, <laughs> but it's all, it's all metaphorical. And I mean, Powerful sometimes how, for sure. She it was, is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like remembering too, that when we in the underworld, we're facing our own shadow too. Mm -hmm. And the shadow wants to be witnessed. It wants to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a good place to start. Mm -hmm meeting the shadow self and being compassionate with it and saying oh you're stuck down here what do you need what do you need to be heard or seen mm -hmm. yes you got me at a loss for words it's just uh, really, really it's okay yeah i know it's like i mean i could probably go on forever so i'm gonna just stop for no <laughs> i know it's so hard but uh, thank you for that for that reflection um there is another question here about your daily practices you are writing your daily spiritual practice uh, can, can I, i'm sorry sydney can you give me one second i have to put my dog in the other room she's whimpering at my feet one sec she's got me everybody. daisy come daisy come gotta take care of the puppy yeah, so <laughs> okay, go. Go ahead. Good girl. There oh we go. Gosh. So sorry. She usually just sleeps at my feet the whole time. To wake up. <laughs> I think it's probably just almost supper time, that's why. Oh <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. That happens here at our house too. So, so Gail asked about your daily spiritual practice while you were writing. Did it change and how did it support you in your work? Oh, yeah. Um, my daily spiritual practice, it didn't change so much. It, um, I think it just became stronger and more um, firm. Mm -hmm. So every day I would get up and I meditate. I try to go for a walk in the morning someplace. I live in the woods, so mm -hmm. it's um it's pretty great just to be able to connect with nature like that. And mm -hmm. um and yes, meditating and asking the muses, the goddesses to come to me in whatever way that they're meant to come that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of a daily thing that I, I try to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so 
we're I think now at about the time like um, you know before we do a final sort of review of you mm -hmm. know where people can reach you and how they can you know um, access copies of, of your book. Um, are you still feeling that uh, you're able to share either a reading or a uh, sure you yeah maybe a, a meditation with us? I think yeah, I'd, I'd love to if if anyone wants to hear one. It's from the one I've selected today is from my next book. A lantern in the dark it's um it's a meditation for letting go mm -hmm. and one of the reasons i chose it for today sydney and i were talking just before we came on and i thought we had the new moon in scorpio yesterday which is intimately connected with releasing grieving letting go and i think a lot of us are in that place right now um for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. um but, i mean collectively everything from climate change and politics to personal situations and life specifics so i thought that i would share this particular meditation on on letting go today if that's okay with everyone that sounds lovely okay we're here we're putty in your hands danielle okay thank you <laughs> i just have to pull it up one sec there we go I'm just going to cross my legs and get comfortable. Me too. <laughs> okay. So I invite you all, if it feels right, to close your eyes and take a few deep centering breaths. I'm going to read a tiny bit of a preamble here and then get into the meditation. So this is the path working called letting go with ocean medicine. Living at the water's edge in the Pacific Northwest, I am blessed to behold the ever changing moods of the sea on a daily basis. Neptune's connection with the ocean is poetry containing hidden messages about letting go and allowing change. Connecting with the soul of the sea, even if you live in a desert, is a powerful metaphor for navigating the threshold that is to come. You are walking through a deep cedar forest. The fog is low and the mist is a living thing encircling the roots of trees. You can scarcely see your feet as you make your way along the path. Overhead, a raven's hoarse voice sounds and you inhale the deep green scent of the woods. You are carrying a small bundle that is becoming a little heavy and you want to sit down and rest for a while. Suddenly you realize that you are standing before the same Douglas fir with gnarled roots that you could have sworn you already passed. The ghostly fog is like a shroud of gauze and it is impossible to see what direction you are moving in. You are in a landscape of swirling mists and the path is not straightforward. You realize that you are lost and pause for a moment, trying to get your bearings. With your sense of sight obscured by the fog, you close your eyes and tune into your other senses and ways of knowing. Somewhere, not too far off, you hear the rhythmic sound of the ocean meeting the shore and you follow the measured cadence. You come out of the woods onto a vast stretch of sand. The increasing strength of sunlight through the fog becomes a brilliant white light that envelops the sea and the mountains beyond are hidden from your view. You hear the sound of small waves gently lapping the shore and breathe deeply the scent of salt and sand. You sit on a sun-bleached driftwood log and a few feet away, a small fire crackles encircled with stones. You open the bundle you've been carrying. Inside, 
are things you know it's time to let go of. You might find grief, old wounds, identities, or relationships that no longer serve you. You reach deep into the bundle and one by one, take out those things you've been carrying that have become so heavy. Allow these things to assume a shape or a symbol and gently take each from your bundle and acknowledge it, honoring it as a part of your story. Lay each on the sand at your feet. When you have completely emptied the bundle, you rise and take these things to the little fire, reverently giving them over to the blaze. You watch as the flames catch, transforming the things of the past into soft gray ash. Carefully you bend and scoop up the ashes and carry them to the water's edge. You wade in, the water is warmer than you expected and the white light is blazing now as the sun begins to burn its way through the fog. Allow the water to hold you safely like a womb. You cup your hands and blow the ashes into the sea. The ebbing tide scatters them and pulls them further and further away until they disappear. If you have tears to shed, allow them to flow freely and become part of the ocean. The dazzling fog is lifting now, revealing brilliant patches of blue sky and the clear outline of the mountains beyond. The sun on the water sparkles like a thousand diamonds, creating opalescent prisms. You wade further into the warm, enveloping water and gently bathe your face, your hair, feeling the soothing, life-giving waters cleanse away the past and renewing you as you prepare to move into the next chapter of your story. So whenever you are ready, you can open your eyes, come back into the room. Mm. How, oh. wow, thank you. <laughs> the releasing of those ashes into the sea is just wonderful. Um, so this is a path working from the uh, from a lantern in the dark? Is that yes, it? yes. Yes, it is. Wow. Yeah, it's there's there's a few in there in that book. And that's one of them for letting go and ocean medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, it's um, it's a little hard to gather myself. <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Conversation, it's when... but it's okay. um, I'm really looking forward to um, like even sort of holding, ha you know, not having my attention be able to be completely fully immersed. Uh, I just felt that was a very powerful experience. So I'm I'm just really looking forward to, um, uh, you know diving into that. So Judy has asked if you talk about Sedna. I just saw that. Um, no, I don't talk specifically about Sedna in this book. I mentioned Sedna in the 12 faces of the goddess. I think I, I think I, I do correlate her with the sign Pisces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So but that's a, a great question. I, I love Sedna. Mm -hmm. it's a wonderful goddess archetype. So, Danielle, our time is coming to a close here soon. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share? Um, or we definitely would like to hear how we can, how people can be in touch with you or find sure, your yeah. 
your resources, your your books, where where we can do that? Absolutely, sure. Um, so books always try to find them at your local bookstore <laughs> right. first. Um, if they don't have have them in, ask if they can order them in because of course we want to support local always first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Other than that, um, they're at all the big chains like Barnes and Noble, Chapters Indigo in Canada. Um, lots of metaphysical stores will have them. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you want to, they are also uh, on Amazon too. So, right. so, so they're the there. Pardon? All the, all the usual spots. All the usual spots, yes. Um, you can connect with me on Facebook. Feel free to send me a Facebook friend request if you like, that's totally fine. I also have a Facebook business page, but I'm more active on the, the regular one. What were you gonna ask, sorry, Sydney? Oh, just oh, acknowledging um, your, your, your website. My apologies, I was a little distracted looking oh. to get your uh, website address, but uh, it's not coming Oh, up. right. Oh, it's... um danielleblackwood.com okay so it's a very easy one to remember and on instagram um at danielle blackwood astrologer is how you can find me so i post regularly um about the zeitgeist the energy of the day um mm -hmm. if something significant is happening i will talk about that so and if you feel like sending me a, a question or a, an email i'm at danielleblackwood at gmail.com so there's a few ways that we can be in touch. Oh, that's that's excellent. I'm so glad you were able to come and, and join us for our chat Me too. this evening. Um, such a pleasure. I always in, enjoy when we have a chance to, to connect. And um, I want to thank um, the folks who have uh, joined with us today and, and um, thank you. it's a wonderful conversation and, and, and being together in community. Um, these are, um, these uh, Facebook live chats are uh, Sisterhood of Avalon offering. Uh, we uh, call them, uh, this is part of our Coracle series. These are Coracle live chats, uh, books, bards, and ballads uh, that uh, Danielle has so graciously uh, been, been a part of this evening. And um, I want to encourage you to keep, to everyone to keep your eye open for upcoming events. I'm a little more prepared this evening I can tell you that uh, in December on December 3rd we have Robin Cole uh, coming to participate in this series and then um, in January uh, Alicia Grasso uh, it, it will be our our guest so uh, please keep your eye on the Sisterhood of Avalon page or the Coracle uh, Facebook group for more information about those events free here on Facebook Live as we chat with people who uh, dance with the muse and, and uh, um, you know, uh, offer their creativity in, in the world. So uh, with that, unless, uh, yeah, uh, there's uh, anything else that um, was on your mind, Danielle, it's been such a pleasure. I did have one more thing I forgot to mention. Um, I have a I have a, a whole series of workshops starting in the new year that oh. I would love for you to join. It's actually called a Lantern in the Dark workshop series, and they will be based on the specific crossroad times. So if you would like to, you can check out my website, which I already um, gave you. The address is DanielleBlackwood.com, mm -hmm. and you'll you'll have you can see when I announce that. So. Everything oh, from the first Saturn return through the midlife transits and then through the second Saturn return. So that is really exciting. We will definitely have to keep our eye open for that. Thank you. I'd love you to join me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, have a wonderful evening, everybody. And thank um, you, everyone. And thank you, Sydney. <laughs> you're welcome. It's been, been my pleasure. I always feel like I'm in great hands when I talk with you. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So much. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely evening, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.